Tonight is the final Zoom seminar for this school year. I welcome for this occasion James Yellen, who many in tonight's audience heard speak at school assembly in February. As a reminder, Jim has a long and distinguished career, starting with his service as a Green Beret in Vietnam, and then with many assignments in the Foreign Service overseas, culminating with his service as ambassador to Burundi. Jim will begin tonight with his own description of what makes a good ambassador, a topic on which, based on our long friendship, I am confident Jim will have strong and clear opinions about. Larry Wohler is, is a resident of Rappahannock County and like Jim has a long and distinguished career as a diplomat culminating in his service as U.S. Ambassador to the Central African Republic. He was also posted in other capitals in Africa as well as Brussels and Moscow and presently is involved in an organization, I believe as chairman, called Youth for Understanding, which works on international exchange programs for high school students. Larry is going to speak about the day-to-day -day challenges of being the top US diplomat in a foreign country. What does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis to represent the US in foreign and often unfriendly and demanding environments? Two closing uh, comments. First, I wanna just thank both gentlemen for participating as well as for their decades of service uh, on behalf of the United States. And second, I wanna challenge the Wakefield students to go on their Google telephone and, or telephone uh, internet connections and see if they can locate Burundi and the Central African Republic and the capital of each such country because um, if you can do that, I think you'll have an opportunity to ask these two gentlemen some interesting questions about two cities that are very different from the United States. With that introduction, I'll turn it over to Jim. Uh, well, Paul, uh, as you said, I'm going to speak on the missions of an ambassador and the qualities of what I think I think make a good ambassador. But before I do, uh, I want to thank you and, uh, and the Wakefield School uh, for inviting me to participate in this event and for having the opportunity to speak before this marvelous audience. What is the mission of an ambassador? I think an ambassador in terms of policy, in terms of policy has three core missions. One, to report truthfully. Two, to convey to Washington the to convey to Washington the policy of the host government and to convey to the host government the policy of Washington. Let me rephrase that in a different way. If you are the United States ambassador to South Africa, you should tell South Africa what United States policy towards South Africa is. <coughs> Excuse me. And you should tell the United States government what United States policy towards South Africa is. So three core missions, it seems to me, in terms of policy for uh, an ambassador. One, to report truthfully. Two, to convey Washington policy to the host government. And three, to convey to the host government uh, 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 the policy of Washington. What are the qualities that make a good ambassador? There are many qualities that make a good ambassador, but here are a few that I consider especially important. Don't lie. You don't have to say everything you know, but don't lie. Of course, there's a moral aspect, but there's also a practical aspect. If you lie, people will find out that you're lying. And so they may not believe you when even you're telling the truth. Next, say the same thing to everyone. 
if you are in a country where there's a rebellion and you criticize the rebels for human rights abuses, you should criticize the government also for human rights abuses. My experience when I was ambassador in Burundi was that if I criticized both sides, even handedly, each side would know that I'm also criticizing the other side. And if I were being even handed, they would, they would listen to me, even though they may not like it. So say the same thing to everyone. Be guided by facts, not by emotion when you are reporting. This is one of the, 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 the greatest failures of reporters to let emotion guide their reporting. It certainly happened to me when I was in Vietnam. I didn't believe the North Vietnamese government would ever negotiate with the United States government to end the war. As you may know, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a war in, in, in Vietnam between the communists in the North and, and a, a, a non-communist government in the South. I never thought the, my emotion said, they'll never negotiate with the United States government. But that turned out not to be true. They did negotiate and they concluded a deal with the United States government. I was guided by my facts, by my emotion, not by facts. The deal wasn't very favorable to the South Vietnamese, but that's another issue. Allow dissent. Allow members of your, of your staff to disagree with you and to disagree with Washington. It benefits both you and Washington. Also, don't undermine the president. If you are the United States ambassador to England and you disagree with the United States policy towards England, you should either resign or support the policy even though you don't agree with it. I know some ambassadors think they have a moral obligation to convey to the host government a policy that differs from that of the president. I think that's a grave, grave error. Either you support the policy of the president or you resign. I might add that I didn't always practice what I preach. And that's one of the reasons I learned that these are the qualities that make a, a good ambassador because I suffered the consequences of not practicing what I preached. Lastly, a few little things. Know something about economics. Even if your primary interest is politics, economics and politics are closely uh, related and, and you need to know something about economics. Do something else before you enter the diplomatic service. Be in business, work for a foundation, but have some work experience before you enter the diplomatic service. And lastly, be really proficient in the language of the country where you are serving. That doesn't mean just speaking the language well. It me me means speaking the language with excellence. I served in Arabic countries where Arabic speakers have gone to the foreign ministry or talked with other high officials and, and, and Arabic speakers who spoke good Arabic. And they tried to have a conversation in Arabic with the official of the host government. It didn't last very long because most high officials and foreign ministry officials in countries where you, you will serve will speak excellent English. So pretty soon the high official of the Arabic speaking country got tired of listening to the, the good Arabic of his interlocutor and broke into excellent English. That's really all I have to say. And I would welcome your views on what I have had and what I have said. Thank you. Um, Larry, maybe we can go to yes. you next and have sure. Q and A, both of you combined at the end. Absolutely. Um, and let me say, I, I agree absolutely with uh, all the Jim's points. He makes some some really good ones. Um, and very much I subscribe to those. 
Um, let me just take a little uh, a personal angle on this. Um, uh, for a career diplomat, becoming ambassador is, is something new. It's a special role, one that your career prepares you in many ways in terms of understanding how diplomacy works, how the State Department works, maybe knowing language, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't quite prepare you for this sense of you, you know, but stops here in a way that it never had before. As an ambassador, you're appointed by the president, you're confirmed by the, the Senate. You are the president's representative in that country. Um, and we all know that a moment may come when you're ambassador, uh, when you, your people, American citizens are going to face real danger. And you don't get to turn around and ask somebody else what to do, at least uh, not completely. Obviously, you can't just go off and do anything you want to do. But you're it. People are looking to you to make decisions and get people safely out of danger, uh, getting yourself out of danger. Your decisions in this case will matter in a way they never have before. That happened to my colleague at the time, in 2012, when I was ambassador, uh, Ambassador Chris Stevens in uh, 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 Libya, a brilliant officer um, doing his job, which was to get out and talk to people to try and help the Libyans put their country back together again. Um, and that meant taking risks. And he paid for that with, with his life. You know, some people criticized him, said, hey, you shouldn't have been out there. But that's what it means to be a, a diplomat and be, to be a, an ambassador in a country where America matters and where people are looking to America to help them uh, chart the way forward. Um, and it's an interesting thing. When you compare ambassadors and generals, uh, we are similar in the sense that we're both managing, con uh, preparing to manage conflict on behalf of our country, right? Like generals get their soldiers ready to go should there be a violent conflict, and then they can send them out to protect American interests. Um, but when that violent conflict happens, it's not the general who goes out uh, to... Uh, to, to fight the enemy. It's, he sends out his, his soldiers to do that. Ambassadors, too, are fundamentally about helping to manage and resolve conflicts. Uh, hopefully, our, if we are successful, they never become violent. Sometimes they're a uh, conflict over e economics. You know, when I was in Japan, we fought tooth and nail over trade issues. It didn't become violent, but that's what we were doing. We were resolving conflict. And then sometimes you're in a place where there is a conflict and there is real danger. And then unlike the general who sends his troops out, in the case of Chris Stevens, he was the one who was out there. It's the ambassador who's there on the front line because he's the one that people want to talk to. Um, and that's why we've lost more ambassadors in the line of duty in the last 50 years than we have lost generals. Um, it happened to me in a, in a somewhat different way. Actually, only two months after Chris Stevens died, I was the ambassador in Bangui. Um, and rebels had come down from the north uh, in a series of pitched battles defeated the Central African Army and were a day's, a day's drive outside of the capital, Bangui. Um, and my job at that point the, uh, was to get our people out, get our people out, get the American citizens out, and get them out in 24 hours. Um, and that, I tell you, focuses the mind 
Uh, because if you get it wrong, if you make the wrong decisions, uh, people could, could die. And we had no guns. We had no soldiers. We did have the entire U.S. government mobilizing uh, to, to uh, send airplanes to get us for hours. Um, but we were the ones who had to convince the Central African government to let, let us go and not try and hold us hostage. And that, that day, you know, as soon as we informed the Central African government that we had American Air Force planes flying in to pick us and American citizens up, the, the, president's, uh, the Central African president's office called me and said, President Bozuse wants to see you now. And my deputy said, don't go, don't go. He might hold you hostage. I said, no, I have to go. I'm the ambassador. I cannot not go. And so I went with my driver, just the two of us in our car. And we went in and met the president. Um, and we luckily, I had had two years of building up a good personal relationship with him. So he, he begged me to stay, but he never tried to threaten me. Um, and that night, we got of our people out the airport, and we flew out, out of the country. So that's the kind of situation you never want to be in, and hopefully, you know, most people never are. But when you become an ambassador, so that's part of it. You know that at some point you may be tested, and uh, you have to be ready to, to respond. Um, Everything that Jim said about, you know, it, hey, it was a true in spades here. You have to know your country. You have to speak the language. You have to be able to reach into people and talk to them personally. Um, and that makes all, all the difference. Um, so that's not exactly a day-to-day -day <laughs> conversation, uh, uh, but I, I thought that would be an, an interesting anecdote for you. And I'm happy to go on further, but why don't I stop there for now? Cause we're already at 723, I see. And maybe you wanna uh, take it in a different direction at this point, Paul? Hello? No, thank you. Thank you both for your comments. I mean, uh, they're very informative and now I'm gonna um, open it up for some questions. I have one question here in the chat box and would encourage more. And this is a, a rather erudite question. Um, and that is, might you offer some observations to our students when you see current headlines uh, about troubled African countries, uh, both politically and economically? Do you ever think of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Um, so we've got a very learned um, student or teacher here who has read Conrad's um, short short book. Uh, one phrase that I I recall was in the destructive element of Merce. And I wonder if, since both of you spent considerable time in Central and East Africa, if you might have any reaction to to that. <laughs> I go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, Jim, go ahead. Well, I I think that's a marvelous question, and I think it's a very pertinent question because I think, how should I say, there are diplomats and other foreigners, I, I, I might add, residing in African countries, who have a Joseph Kurtz complex. <laughs> who somehow feel that they can be the savior of the country where they are serving. It's an extraordinarily uh, misguided point of view, but it's not an uncommon one. And uh, I've seen it among diplomats. And I'm thinking about my service in, in, in the Congo. And, well, I've seen it among diplomats in spades in the Congo, and, and I've seen it among, among uh, European residents uh, of the Congo in spades. So yes, 
it, it's a real phenomenon, the Joseph Kurtz uh, syndrome. Uh, let me just, um, uh, I, I certainly agree with that. Let me just add something else on. Uh, when we, in, in uh, the West, as you can call it, sort of the United States, when we look at the, the problems that a number of African countries have, A, we, we tend to hear more about the problems and not about countries like S Senegal, for example, um, or um, certainly Ivory Coast, which had problems, but to come back, uh, Rwanda, which is some interesting perspectives there. But these are countries that are actually doing quite well economically and have shown real growth. And, and certainly in cases of Senegal, some you know, real move toward the democratic transition of power. Um, but for the countries where um, there's been a lot of problems with poor governance and corruption, it's, it's obviously there and we need to focus on it more. But one of the things I think we fail to focus on is the level of corruption, which is often the driver of this governance and it's, and it's grown steadily, is directly linked to the banks and financiers in the West. All that money that goes out, it's, it's going through European banks and American banks and holding companies. Um, so it's, it's not just their problem. It's a problem that we have helped create. And the, uh, the Africans by themselves really can't, can't solve these problems. Could I just say, I, I think the point that you can't paint all Africans with one brush. Some countries are doing poorly, some countries are doing well. I think that's a very, very important point. There, um, there's some other questions in the chat box that I'll, I'll get to, but I wanted to ask each of you a pretty mundane question. And, and that is, um, Jim, when you were in, in Burundi, I think the capital then was Bujumbura. Um, what's it like to live there as ambassador? Do you get a, a palace to live in with lots of Marines guarding you? Or um, do you ever get to go out on the street and, and enjoy local food? What's it really like to spend two years in a, in a capital like that? And then that's a good and interesting question. First off, the capital is still Bujumbura. The fact of the matter, as an ambassador, you live well. In fact, you live too well. <laughs> you live in a, <laughs> in a, you know, wonderful quarters with, with servants and you don't need all that. So you live, not only do you live well, you live very, very well. And, uh, and uh, 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 although you have some security in Bujumbura, our principal security, the principal security of my residence came from the fact that I had that I had contacts with the rebels. That's the only thing that protected my residence from being attacked. Uh, we didn't have enough, uh, we only had a local guard. The Marines guarded the embassy itself, but not, not, the, uh, not the residents. Yes, you can go out. I mean, you can live, a, uh, you know, there are wonderful restaurants in Bujumbura that you can eat at, uh, but you're living a, a life that's, detached from the reality of someone living in the hills of Bujumbura, who are um, maybe the poorest people on earth, who literally live in rags. I'm not saying apocryphally live in rags, literally live in rags, or filthy dirty because they never get to bathe, walk kilometers to get, the, to, 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 to get their money, to get their water, and probably don't even live on a, a, a and probably have little if any cash and have to live by barter. Mm. Larry? Um, you know, it's, um, it, it varies so much from country to country. If, when, I, when I think of ambassadors who lived well, I think of Spassel House in Moscow, uh, which had mm -hmm. its own ballroom. 
um, <laughs> and organize countless amazing cultural events. Um, but you know, very much in the service of of connecting Americans and, and Russians. I mean, the ambassador did a, a wonderful job there. In Bangui, my house was much, much smaller. I had no ballroom, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, you're, you're right, you certainly live well, well compared to the population. Um, but um, there are also, you know, interesting challenges. My, my, my wife, spent enormous amounts of time uh, managing the, the household. We, we hosted a lot, a lot of dinners and people expected those dinners to be good. We hosted the 4th of July reception and we had no outside caterer to come and do it. We had to do all of that, get it all ready for 250 people, including the president of the country. My wife did all of that for free. Um, that was her contribution to, to, to America. Um, so you, you, you pull everybody in, in situations like that. Um, we were lucky as you were, Jim, that we didn't have actually a lot of security. So we were able to drive around town. We went out, we drove out to the, uh, to the national parks, uh, such as they, they were. Uh, but a lot of other ambassadors these days live with constant security. Uh, that's something that's changed tremendously over the last tw uh, tw uh, 20 years. Okay, okay let, me, um, let me go to some chat questions. Um, for uh, Jim Yellen, why did you become ambassador to Burundi how did that opportunity arise? Well, it wasn't a decision made by me. Uh, it was a decision made by, by the State Department. They chose me to be the ambassador. They thought I would be uh, a suitable ambassador. I don't know, I don't know if that was, they were right in that, that choice, but it, the decision wasn't mine in any way. But I, I gladly accepted the assignment and it was a marvelous assignment. Okay. Um, we've got some more questions, um, more in your area, Jim. H how much do you think the outside countries are responsible for the ethnic conflicts in Burundi and Rwanda? I think they have, well, I think the, the basic responsibility lies clearly with the Burundians and clearly were the ones, I, I don't think it's any question about that. They bear the, the primary responsibility for that, no outside country. And as a, a, a follow-up to that. No, let, let, me, let me continue, Paul, if I just want, but, but I, I want to add that it's clear that the French uh, supported uh, the Hutu military and, and, the, and the Hutu, um, police that were responsible for many of the massacres of the Tutsis. Uh, the French didn't encourage them to, 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 uh, to, to kill the Tutsis, but the French clearly gave them training and arms and knew they were killing the Tutsis. As, that, that as a follow-up, right. sorry, as a follow-up, how do you think the fighting between the Tutsi and Hutus can be resolved? Well, that's an excellent question, and I don't have the answer to it. I haven't. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I do not know. But l l let me t tell you. I mean, th th this is a, this is a sort of a a, a, a non-response in a way. It will be resolved when both sides see it's in their self-interest to stop the fighting. And that, uh, the question is, what will what will convince them? to stop the fighting. And I will only say this, it's not gonna be foreigners that convince them to stop the fighting. It has to come from them, from within themselves. It ha they have to want to, to, to end it. I'm gonna make a, a, a bit of a, a jump and I wanna talk, uh, uh, 
And I want to talk, and, and a model of how that can happen is Northern Ireland. Let, let me explain briefly to people who may not know it. There was serious fighting between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. And what happened was but both sides saw that it was in their interest to end the fighting. And the people who were the leaders on this both sides were among the most extreme. There was a man named Martin McGuinness, who was a killer responsible for many civilian deaths, who came to see that the end of fighting was in the interest of the Catholics. Uh, there was another guy named Ian Paisley, an extreme right winger, uh, 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 a Protestant conservative, extreme right winger, uh, uh, responsible for the persecution of, 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 of uh, many Catholics. And he came to see that it was the interest of the Protestants to have, to have uh, an, an, uh, a peace agreement. And this is, this is not apocryphal, it's true. Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley became friends. I'm not talking about friends for the newspaper. I've talked to both sides about this. They became real friends. That's, a, that's an example of, of how a peace process, of how the fighting in Burundi has to end or how the fighting in, 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 uh, in Rwanda uh, would have to end or how the conflict would have to end. There's no fighting right now. Right. Larry, I'm, 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 I'm curious, um, do you stay in, in close um, communication or remain knowledgeable about current affairs in the CAE? And if so, um, how, how do you see that situation, the situation in that nation now? Uh, yes, I do follow, follow uh, the, the CAR that you are you're thinking of the Central African Empire, the CAE, which is under a Bokasa, but that was many years ago, and now we've reverted to the Central African Republic, C-A-R. But I've, um, uh, after I retired, I went back to help the United Nations put in place a peacekeeping organization operation that's still there. And I was, last year I went uh, for the State Department to help uh, them put in place a project to try and improve governance, um, especially in the security sector, to get make the army better, better, better organized, more accountable, et cetera. Um, something that was really desperately needed. And I continued to talk to people there. And in fact, was before COVID, I was. Uh, uh, advising a group that was trying to put in place a grassroots anti-corruption drive, uh, which I think is what it's got to come from the grassroots, and you know, and they've got to focus on the, the corruption problem, which is not just the senior leaders. You know, it's not just the the president and those people. Corruption is all the way down through society, right down to the public school teachers who want money to give people a good grade, right? And and until that's, that's, you, that's, you, that's right. You hadn't thought about that one, had you? <laughs> um, but you know, and, be a and, and until people kind of come together and say, we really all have to give up corruption. Um, the country really doesn't have much of a way forward. It's been, it's very sad. It's very sad because the people are suffering. All right. Okay. So, um, I'll check. Greg, would you have any, uh, more questions? You're, uh, an, an expert in the field, so to speak. Uh, I was asking about Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, which I had to read in high school and hated. And, and then later <laughs> on, when I studied the problems of colonialism, that, that was my question. Do you ever think of Heart of Darkness when you read the headlines? And, and 
you know, I, I think the answer has something helpful in it for, for st high school students. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't, I, hmm. not quite sure. What, Jim, what, what do you think on that one? Well, I mean, I, I think it's an instructive book to read. I, I agree with Greg. I think it, uh, it's an, an, an instructive book about the human psychology and how some people behave when, when, they're, when, uh, they're, uh, when they're not in their own culture. Mm. I, I, I agree with what Craig has to say. I've got um, one final... <clears throat> A very lengthy question that I'm going to condense. Um, give me a minute here. Um, what do you think about the current situation in Burundi, which may be caused by the fact that the president decided to run for a third term and apparently on an unconstitutional basis? Well, that's, a, that's an, an excellent question. And let me try to give a, a, a very sh short answer to it. Uh, but before I do, I want to say something that has nothing to do with Burundi. I just want to say, express my thanks to, to your marvelous Latin history and English teacher, Welby Griffin, and for the advice she's <laughs> given me on how to learn Latin. I'm a beginning student in Latin, and she's given me marvelous advice on how to learn Latin. But I, I did want to say that. <laughs> Anyhow. Well, uh, I don't know I, if I well think, a, a caller, but I'll give I'll convey that to her tomorrow. Uh, the, what uh, I, I think that the, the question about Burundi is a very interesting. One. I I think it's clear. Um, I don't know if the person knows the history of Burundi a little bit. There was a, a peace agreement called the Arusha Peace Agreement, which provided for power sharing between Hutu and Tutsi which was working very, very well. And in particular, it led to an army in which, believe it or not, the rebels and, and the Burundian army uh, bonded together, I don't know, as comrade in arms. And it became an institution in which there was a, a minimum uh, of ethnic rivalry. And it really reduced the tension between Hutu and Tutsi. The president whom you're talking about in Kurenzis is not just the fact that he ran for a third term. He really sabotaged the Arusha agreement. He didn't believe in it. He believes in Hutu. He believed in Hutu supremacy. And, he's, and uh, he even slowly but surely has managed to destroy the institutional integrity of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Hutu. It, it, it's, an, it's an interesting lesson in uh, why you sh even if there were fair and free elections, which uh, fair and free elections, it's very possible and Kurenziza would, would have been elected. Uh, the elections weren't fair and free. Well, they were technically fair and free, but not really. But even if they were completely fair and free and Kurenziza would have been uh, elected president. So elections are no guarantee uh, of good governance. And so it's not the fact, just the fact that he was, that he was elected for a third term. It was the fact that he, that he underlined, undermined the, the, the agreement that had been reached between Hutu and Tutsi and, and, uh, and preached Hutu supremacy. It has had one unintended consequence and, and a good one. Now the rivalry is not between Hutu and Tutsi. The, 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 the opposition is both Hutu and Tutsi, both Hutu and Tutsi, and they protect each other. So ironically, in one sense, he has, he has, he has worked to, 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 to help improve Hutu-Tutsi relations. Uh, so it, it's a sort of an uh, ironic outcome. But, but the, the cause of it is not just his third election. He, I mean, he's a tyrant, even, if he were, even though he was elected an autocrat and a Hutu supremacist. You know, um, 
what this reminds me of is, you know, since the 90s, American foreign policy in Africa, really around the world, has been about promoting democracy with the idea that if you have free elections and democracy, then things will stabilize. Um, and in the early years, certainly after of the 90s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union, some of the longtime autocrats who were compelled to go to elections ended up losing because they didn't understand how to manipulate an election. Well, that has long since passed. Today's presidents have figured out how to manipulate elections and how to have a veneer of democracy without having the real thing. Um, and so you have all of these presidents who go from election to election um, and surprise, surprise, they keep on winning. Um, and so for the United States and, and our allies, we're really stuck now with this quandary. What do we do with these political systems that look like democracy, but they aren't? We don't know what to do. I was going to just say, I just absolutely agree with everything that Larry said. And I, I would add an addendum. I think the key to progress, not in, 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 in countries, not just African countries, is not elections, it's rule of law. I won't go bothering definition of what rule of law is, but it's rule of law, not elections. That, 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 that are the key to political, economic, and security uh, progress, it seems to me. So gentlemen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it a, a curtain here because our students have a lot of homework in front of them. But before I do that, I'm gonna offer the, our, your, your colleague and the acting, ex acting ambassador to uh, Brazil, I believe, or Jamaica, I can't recall, but your colleague, Lacey Wright, if you would like to add anything. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to just uh, one last question. Uh, go, going back to your discussion early on about uh, violence and uh, the need to protect uh, the embassy and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we haven't talked about that. You haven't talked about this yet, but you know there's a cost to uh, taking extreme measures to keep uh, American ambassadors and diplomats safe, and that cost is that it's much more difficult for <clears throat> embassy officers if they cannot leave the embassy, or if they can leave the embassy only uh, under armed guard, to get to know the country. Uh, at, an, at an extreme, one might say, why not just stay back in Washington and make phone calls to people in the country? Uh, of course, uh, no one seriously thinks that that's what we should do, but there is a trade-off, there is a cost. And uh, I wonder if, if you could both uh, uh, comment on that and where the, uh, where the line should be drawn. You know, when we were in Vietnam, Jim remembers this, uh, there, there were no uh, RSO rules about where you could go. Uh, on, on, you were expected to take care of yourself and not do anything stupid. Uh, that generally worked, although I have to say that a lot of foreign service officers uh, and, uh, uh, and other uh, US government employees got killed in Vietnam. Today, almost no one gets killed, almost, uh, but there is the cost that I have uh, mentioned. So where do you mm -hmm. draw the line? Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, we, we have tr gotten too close to a zero risk kind of mentality. As I said, after I retired, I went back with the United Nations to set up their peacekeeping operation. And although there was a, a lot about UN management style that I was not impressed with, what I was impressed with was their uh, approach to managing risk. They accepted that their people had to be out there, that there would be risk, 
And then, but they would look and say, okay, well, what is the likelihood of that risk actually coming to pass? And when they judged the likelihood was, was not that high, they would go because they had to go. They had, their people had to be out there. And I thought they, they did that well. Uh, but, you know, the reality is we are in, um, in, in places like, like, you know, obviously that's not true in Belgium, but if you're in Central Africa, we live with risk and we have to live with risk. Well, I agree entirely with what Lacey and Larry said. I, I think you have to have to accept a, a fairly substantial amount of risk in order to, to get out in the community. Otherwise, what's the point of having an embassy? All right. Okay, gentlemen. Well, well, thank you very much for your conversation and insights um, this evening. And um, I hope that we can entice you to uh, remain involved in various ways with Wakefield Country Day School. I know Jim and Lacey are scheduled to come uh, Friday for uh, an event. And Larry, you're welcome anytime. We would love to stay in touch with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank All you. right.